Today I'm going to start a brand new teaching entitled The Believer's Authority. And this is going to be kind of a prolonged teaching, but I think it's going to really, really help you. The first thing that I want to establish when you start talking about spiritual authority is that most people have a humanistic uh, impression or view of how things go. And I know that Christians don't like that terminology, but really a lot of Christians have adopted that mentality. What I mean by humanistic is that they only look at things on a surface level. They don't recognize the spiritual realm that is behind everything. This is the way that the humanists are. They don't acknowledge God as a, a whole. They are agnostic or either atheist, and they believe that everything is just physical and natural, and that everything has natural physical causes and all of these kind of things. And sad to say, a lot of Christians even have that same attitude, that they don't realize the spiritual implications behind what is going on. But this very first teaching that I'm going to do is just to underscore that we are in a spiritual war. There is a battle raging every single day in the spiritual realm for your heart and, of course, the hearts of every single person, the hearts of society, the whole world as a whole. But God is trying to influence people and draw them towards righteousness, towards Himself, living consistent with Him so that the blessings of God can manifest in their life. And Satan has an all-out war going, trying to steal the hearts of men away from God so that he can uh, pour his trash and the corruption that he has into their life. And honestly, most people, even most Christians, they don't recognize that there is an intense battle warring over you every single day. And the choices that you make, the things that you say, your actions, these things determine whether God is going to control and dominate and release the life and the blessing of that he has to offer into your life, or whether Satan dominates. Satan cannot just control you outside of your will, but you need to recognize that you're in a battle. If you will choose to believe it and learn and recognize what's going on and begin to start taking the proper action, then you can improve your situation. You can resist the devil, James 4, 7 says, and he will flee from you. But if you aren't resisting, then your passiveness doesn't mean that the battle isn't raging. It is raging. It just means simply that you aren't going to be winning. Satan is going to be beating you in this area. So I think that this teaching on spiritual warfare, this whole teaching on the authority of the believer is going to be something that's going to make a huge difference in your life. There's a lot of scriptures on this, but here's one in Ephesians chapter 6. And in verse um, uh, 10, it says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now this terminology here where it talks about we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places... This is referring to demonic powers. There is like a, uh, uh, a chain of command. There's an authority structure in the demonic realm, apparently, and this is listing these different levels. But notice that it says here that we are wrestling not against flesh and blood. There are many people that honestly just don't recognize that much of the stuff that goes on in your life is not just human. It is not just natural. People are being influenced and controlled by the devil. Now, in this series, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, and we're going to eventually talk about Satan's power, about how the, we have authority over all of these kind of things. I'm not going to get into this right now, and I'm not going to get into this thing about are people possessed or oppressed or depressed. Uh, you know, I really believe that most of that is useless to be able to debate that. In the Greek, in the New Testament, when it says that a person was demon-possessed, if you look it up in the Greek, the word literally means demonized. It just means that they were under the control of the devil. And this thing that Christianity has tried to make about are you possessed or oppressed or, or depressed or whatever, it's really not there in the Scripture. The fact is that people are being influenced and controlled and used by the devil. They really are. And I think that this needs to be said because there's a lot of people that honestly believe that all the demons are in Africa. 
that they're over in some third world country. But I guarantee you there is a, an abundance of demonic activity. And what I'm trying to say through all of this is that we just look at a lot of things as being natural. A lot of the things that happen during the day to tick you off, to come, uh, come at you, and things like this, we just look at it as being normal, natural, and we don't recognize that there is spiritual influence behind it. If we were to adopt the mindset that this is talking about right here and recognize that it is not a physical battle, it's not that person that sits next to you at work, it's not your neighbor, it's not your husband or your wife, and all of these things that are really coming against you, but they can be influenced and inspired and used of Satan to come against you. If you were to recognize that, it would make a huge difference in the way that you respond. For instance, one of the ways that this has worked in my life is that, you know, I get a lot of hate mail. I get people criticizing me because of the things that I say. And there was a time that, honestly, I took these things personally, and I thought, why is this person so upset at me? And I just looked at it on a human basis and always tried to deal with this. But, you know, I've come over a period of time to recognize that Satan is the one that's trying to get my attention off of what God has told me to do and I just recognize that Satan is using some person to come against me. And because I look beyond the person and don't take it personally as if this person is just put out with me, I look beyond that and recognize that Satan is just trying to use them to gain an inroad into my life. It allows me to, to um, put it into a different perspective and deal with it differently. I don't take it personally. I've actually had some people come against me. I mean, people who are friends of mine who have done some pretty mean things, have done some things to me. And you know what? I am able to look right past that, forgive that person, recognize that they are coming from a position, that they had a sensitivity in some areas. Satan took advantage of that and just used them. And I've been able to totally look beyond them, recognize what Satan is trying to do, and not be angry at this person, not be bitter at them totally walk in forgiveness. When they do turn around and they do recognize what has happened, I've been able to just completely establish relationship with them again because I was recognizing that it wasn't just that person. It was just Satan trying to get at me. I know some of you may not agree with this, but here is where the Lord asked His disciples. This is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You know what Jesus is saying is that Peter didn't say this just from his own human understanding. This wasn't a conclusion that he came to and arrived at on his own, but he was under the influence of his heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit had given him this, and it was supernatural revelation. But I want you to notice that it says in um, verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he should go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now this is the same day, just moments after Jesus had asked, who do people say that I am? And they gave these answers and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, led, controlled, being given inspiration by the Holy Spirit, said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in just moments after that, Jesus began to say that I'm going to be led to Jerusalem. They're going to take me. They're going to kill me. And I will rise again the third day. And this same Peter who had been inspired and controlled by the Holy Spirit just moments before, it says in verse 22, it says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In other words, he did not want to even consider the thought that Jesus would be taken and killed. And he apparently missed this statement that Jesus made, that he would be raised again on the third day. He didn't even listen to the rest of the thing. He just stopped right there and he said, this be far from you. This is never going to happen. I'm going to stand here and, and the rest of us, we will defend you, but we are not going to allow this to happen to you. <clears throat> and look at Jesus' response in verse 23. It says, He turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. 
Jesus had commended him just moments before for saying, you know what, this isn't just from you, Peter, but this is the Holy Spirit. My Father, through the Holy Spirit, inspired you and gave you this revelation. And then in just moments, he turns around and he calls Satan by name and he says, get thee behind me, Satan, showing that Satan was speaking through Peter. This was not something that was coming from God. This was inconsistent with the will of God. And Peter was being inspired and controlled by the devil in the things that he said. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. And you know what? There's a lot of people that honestly, they just think this is a little bit over the top. They think that, uh, you know, you don't need to respond to people this way. But I can guarantee you that there are times that Satan is speaking directly to you through people. He is using people to get at you. And of course, they may be uh, unaware of the fact that they're being used to the devil. I'm sure that Peter was shocked when when Jesus turned around and said, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm sure that shocked him. I'm sure he was hurt. He was probably offended at this. But you know what? There's times that you've got to do things like this. Now, again, you could misunderstand what I'm saying and you could go over the top and go around anytime anybody's saying anything that disagrees with you, turn around and rebuke them and tell them that they're of the devil and being used of the devil. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that Satan uses people and here is a scriptural example of it. And if you're ignorant of that and you just take these words, then you are going to think, well, man, I must be wrong because I really respect this person. And look, there's three people today that have said the same thing to me. You need to recognize Satan can use people and speak through people. Let me give you an example of this. I I hate to share this. I get rebuked a lot and people misunderstand what I'm saying. But it does illustrate my point. And I pray that you'll just give me a little bit of mercy here and know that I'm not really a mean, bitter person. (laughs) But this really does illustrate what I was talking about. When my oldest son, Joshua, he's now 30 years old, but when he was only one year old, so that would have been 29 years ago, Uh, My mother wanted to take me and my wife and Joshua on a trip to the Smoky Mountains, and we didn't have any money. This is back during our poverty days, and we were really struggling. And so, um, you know, she offered to pay for everything. It was a great deal. So anyway, we took advantage of it. My mother had just tried to start believing God for some healing of things and basically had experienced a defeat. It didn't work, and because of it, she was really kind of on the bubble about whether this healing stuff worked or not, and she was somewhat critical of it. Uh, Just for your sake, she uh, turned around, and she's received great uh, healings since then. But this is back when, in the very beginning, she thought I was out on the lunatic fringe. She tried it. It didn't work exactly the way she wanted. So anyway, when we got ready to go on this trip, she was nursing Uh, a little bit of a cold, and she started speaking negative things about Joshua. Keep him away from me. He's going to catch this cold. And I said, no, he's not going to catch this cold. Then she complained about the money. I really shouldn't be taking this trip. I don't have the money to do it. And I just told her, I said, hey, we have Zippo, Zilch, Nada, money. If you don't have the money to take this trip, we need to go home now because I can't help you. I can't do anything. And she says, oh, no, I've got plenty of money. She just was in a negative mindset, and it was a bad situation. So anyway, during the day, you know, uh, Joshua was sitting in front of the air conditioner. This air conditioner was blowing him, and she'd say things, oh, don't put him there. He'll catch a cold. And I said, he is not going to catch a cold. For those of you who aren't aware of it, you know, you can have what you say. And man, I was just countering all of these negative things. She just griped and complained. It really is out of character for my mother. She's a super lady and usually very positive, but this was just a negative circumstance. She talked negative all day long. It was just a constant battle back and forth to counter these things that were being said. And because she was my mother, I tried to do everything as nice and kind as I possibly could. The very first night, we stayed in a hotel. We all stayed in one room, and we had a little crib that they brought in and put there for Joshua. And anyway, about 11 o'clock or something, Joshua woke up with this croup in his vo- in his uh, throat that you could have heard in the next room. I mean, it was loud. He couldn't hardly breathe. And so I got up, I prayed over him, prayed in tongues, rebuked this stuff, and released my faith. He went back to sleep. Everything was fine. About 30 minutes later, he, the same thing happened. I got up and prayed over him. This went on from about 11 till 2 o'clock every 30 minutes. I was up and down like a yo-yo praying over Joshua and trying to get him back to sleep and everything. And finally, about 2 or 3 in the morning, 
on one of my trips back to the bed, my mother just said, admit it, Andy, he's sick. (laughs) Boy, it just got all over me. Now, again, remember, she had tried it. It didn't look like it worked. She was trying to convince me that, hey, this healing stuff that you're believing for doesn't work. And she just said, admit it, Andy, he's sick. And you know what I did? I don't recommend this, but this is just my testimony. This is what happened. Man, I got right down in her face and stuck my finger in her face. And I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I command you to shut up. I will not receive any of your criticism, any of this curse. Joshua is blessed and not cursed. And I started speaking the word. And you know what? She never said a word. And Joshua never got up again. He was just fine. There wasn't any problem. And for two days, she never said a word. To... We were on vacation. It was an awesome vacation. You can imagine. And finally, when she did speak, she just started crying. Well, I'm sorry you think I'm the devil. And she started into this self-pity thing. And I said, Mother, you know enough. I've told you the word of God. And you knew that that stuff that you were saying was exactly opposite the word and you had just given yourself over to Satan. I said, I'm not mad at you. I was standing against Satan. He was trying to steal my faith from me in this area. And anyway, God has restored the relationship. We've recovered. My mother's one of my very best friends. She's now 91 years old and she's healthy and a blessing and we get along good. But I am saying that, you know what, you can sit there and say what you want to. And many of you think that that's just a little over the top. But you know what, Joshua did not stay sick. He never got up again. He never had another problem with that. And I know that there's a lot of people that just think, well, I just believe that that's a little bit too strong. But you know what, it's true that Satan uses people. We are in a spiritual war And most of the time, people don't recognize this. They're just looking at things in a natural human perspective. It's humanistic is what it is. It's factoring God out of the thing and factoring the supernatural realm out of the thing. It's not just people that are rubbing us the wrong way, but those people are being uh, influenced, sometimes absolutely controlled and dominated by Satan, by an evil power. We see this all of the time, but the average person honestly is not aware of this the way that they should. They just aren't realizing the spiritual dynamics behind things. And to me, it has helped me to be able to handle opposition when I realize that it's not God that does these things. It's it's not just fate. It's not happenstance. But there's an enemy out there. And you know what? You just deal with it. You know, I'm I'm reminded right now of an instance where uh, the very first time that I tried to produce a book, it was our... Life for Today commentary. It was a 600-page book. It was going to be a major expense. And this is, I don't remember the exact time frame, but it was probably uh, 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago when we were doing this. My ministry income was so so low that to come up with a forty or $50,000 uh, to print a book was like two or three months worth of income for me. And I mean, it was really stretching me to the max. Well, this, uh, we had a number of different publishers come and offer to help us do this. And one gave us this deal. And he was going to reduce it to $27,000 if we would go ahead and pay right now. They, were, they said they were in a bind. They needed the money. If we would go ahead and pay up front, that they would give us this deal. So I went to my partners. I raised this money, $27,000, which was more than a month's worth of income at that time. It was a major deal. We gave this $27,000 to them, and it looked like that it was going to be a good deal. And within a month or so after we did that, it turned out that the salesman took our money, not only mine, but Charles Stanley, uh, Nicky Cruz. There was a number of people that got burned by this same guy. He took all of this money and ran with it. And, of course, we lost our money. And I can remember the day that my manager came to me, told me what had happened, and said, this uh, salesman just took our $27,000. We're going to have to come up with an additional $45,000 in just the next week or so to be able to make this thing work. Altogether, over $70,000. You know, I looked at him, and my first reaction was, uh, you know, shock, like, is this really true? And then there was a tinge of just wanting to uh, take this guy that stole the money from us 
and just beat the snot out of them. I guess I just might as well be honest and tell you. That's how I felt. But again, it's the same principle that I'm talking about here. I recognized it's not just a person who did me wrong. You know what this was? It was Satan. It was Satan trying to get at me. It was Satan trying to steal from me. It was Satan that had come against me and had done all of these things. And here's a here, this verse just immediately popped into my uh, thoughts here in Proverbs chapter 6. Let me take the time to turn over here and find this. If you catch a thief, he has to restore sevenfold or give all of the substance of his house to repay. And because I recognized it wasn't just a person who came against me and stole $27,000, and ultimately it was going to cost me like $70,000. You know, because I saw that it wasn't just a person, and I recognized that there was demonic things going on behind it, then my first reaction, I mean outside of just these thoughts that I had, but within seconds after getting this news, I said, this is the devil I didn't get mad at the person. I said, it's the devil stealing from me. I have called him. He's a thief. He has taken from me, and I'm demanding it back seven times. And immediately, I took a piece of paper and began to multiply seven times 72,000 or whatever that was. It came out to 490-something thousand dollars, and instead of being depressed, angry, hurt, shattered all of the things it could have been. I mean, I was dancing and praising God and saying, hallelujah, this is awesome. $490,000 I'm getting back this year. And I began to start praising God and it never did get me down. It never discouraged me. And you know, when that year was over, we increased nearly to the penny, 490 something thousand dollars, exactly seven times the amount of money that was stolen from me. And that was back during a period of time that my entire income probably wasn't, but maybe $500,000 a year or something like that. So we nearly doubled, and I turned something that could have been a tragic situation into a positive situation because I realized that it's not just flesh and blood that I'm fighting, but I'm fighting a spiritual warfare. Satan is trying to come against me. I've actually loaned people money before that they said they'll pay back and they never do. And rather than take offense and get mad at this person, I recognize that this is Satan trying, you know, I'm sure that this person cooperated with them and allowed the devil to do it. But I recognize it's Satan trying to get me into unforgiveness. And so I'll just forgive them. I've actually given people money that at one time they said they'd pay back. And I said, hey, just take it as a gift. I am not going to sit here and have any animosity over this. It's not worth it. And I know that there are some of you that think, man, I'd never do those kind of things. But see, I recognize that there is a battle raging. Nobody, nobody is going to rent space in my mind. Nobody is going to occupy my heart except God. I am not going to have unforgiveness towards anybody. It, I am not going to be in bitterness because I'm aware that Satan uses those things as an inroad against me. See, you need to start recognizing that, like it or not, there is a battle raging right now for your heart and for your mind because as you think in your heart, that's the way you're going to act and ultimately your actions are the greatest expression of your authority and that determines whether they're going to grow you or whether Satan does. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says that if you yield your members as uh, unto sin, then you become the servant to that sin and the author of that sin, which is Satan. Again, that verse is making this same point that, see, there's a battle. There's a spiritual war going on. And your actions determine whether God controls or whether Satan controls. If you yield your members unto God, unto righteousness, then you become a servant to God. Your actions are very, very, very important. And see, most people recognize that actions are important as far as the physical realm goes. You know that if you do something wrong and if you get caught, say, for instance, if you go speeding and you get caught, well, then there's a physical consequence. It may cost you uh, money. It may cost you points and things like this. You could have a wreck. There are physical things, and people recognize this. We recognize sometimes that when we talk about people that we could hurt that person's feelings and that unbelief and strife can do damage to people. And most people see, recognize things on this surface level. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that there's much more to it than just this physical surface level 
There are spiritual dynamics that are going on. And you know, whether a person that you are speaking evil about ever knows about it or not, you know what? If you are venting anger, frustration, uh, resentment, unforgiveness, it affects you, whether it affects anybody else or not. I've actually heard people before in traffic, you know, I, I won't mention names, but I've got some people that I know, in-laws, <laughs> that uh, they are very vocal sometimes when people cut them off in traffic. And I've said something before, and they say, they don't know what I've said. They didn't hear me. Well, see, it doesn't matter if the person ever hears you or not. If you get angry and bitter, you may not recognize it, but you have just yielded yourself to Satan. Satan is the one who has us respond these, these kind of ways. And again, Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you give place to that anger and bitterness, it says in uh, James chapter 1 that the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. It will not accomplish the righteousness of God. You aren't going to accomplish God's purposes by you getting in the flesh and getting angry and losing your temper. That's not the way that it works. And so whether the person ever hears you or not, it is having an effect on you. You know, there was a guy that I led to the Lord one time and this guy really was genuinely converted and he came a long ways and he was doing pretty good. But he was an upholster. He upholstered cars and he was working on this one car. It was an old car that he was trying to restore and I don't know exactly what had happened, but I, I went over to his house. I knocked on the door and I knew that they were supposed to be there, but nobody answered the door. So I walked around the corner of the house into the backyard and he had no car out there that he was working on. And as I came around the corner of this house, uh, house, I heard this profanity, screaming and yelling, and this guy had a fence post and was beating the fire out of this car and using profanity and just saying things about that car. He was blasting this car. And anyways, I came around the corner. Here I was, the pastor of the church, come walking around the corner. This guy sees me and he stops, and I guess he must have got a twinge of conviction. And then he says, well, it's just a car. He says, it doesn't matter what I say to it. He says, it's a car. It doesn't matter if I, you know, damn a car or do whatever. He says, it's a car. I didn't hurt anybody. And what I had to tell him was that it doesn't matter if it's a car. It doesn't matter if it's your dog. It doesn't matter if it's a tree you're mad at. It doesn't matter what it is. If you are giving place to anger like that, inventing this stuff, Satan jumps on that like a chicken on a June bug. I guarantee you Satan is going to take advantage of things like that and it opens up a door into your life that allows Satan to come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. In James chapter 3 verse 16, the scripture there says, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. It didn't say some evil works. It didn't say that, you know, it just could allow the devil to come against certain types of people. No, when you get into envy and strife, did you know that it's just like flinging the door open and saying, come in, Satan, and have a seat and do your worst in my life. It's like drawing a big target on your back and saying, shoot your best shot. You just make yourself uh, a target for the devil. You know, the scripture says, Paul was talking about that he was a sweet savor unto God and a savor that was pleasing unto God. And I'm taking a little bit of liberties here. I'm not sure that this is actually true, but in a symbolic, an allegorical sense, you could at least say this, that if you can be a sweet savor unto God and if God could smell your life, you know, so that it's pleasing unto him, well, then the negative side of that would be that I believe you can be a stink that draws demons. Just like, you know, uh, well, I won't mention, but certain things, man, attract flies and different things. And you know what? Those animals just seem to be able to, they are drawn to that. I believe that there are some people that because of your stinking attitude, because of the rotten things, because of the fact that you get mad in traffic and you're just bitter and you're always critical and you're doing this, you know what? It's putting out an aroma that's drawing every demon in the county to your house. And then you wonder, why am I having problems? Why does nothing go right for me? That's just ignorance gone to seed. You need to recognize that we are in a spiritual war. And your actions and your thoughts 
These kind of things are either releasing the power of God in your life or they are releasing the power of the devil. And there are many of you that just look and you think that fate is against you and that you just have bad luck and you may even put it off at God and say, God, how come you allow all of these kind of things to happen? But it's not like that at all. We have an enemy that is going about seeking whom he may devour. I believe that's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 or 8, right around there, or 9. It says that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. He cannot devour every person. You have to cooperate with him. And you know, one of the ways that Satan gains cooperation is through ignorance. If you think that it doesn't matter if you're mad at a car, if you're mad at a driver who can't hear what you're saying, if because the person isn't there, you're going to gossip about them and talk about things because after all, you know, you, they aren't there. They didn't hear what you say. They may not hear what you say, but I guarantee you when you start venting this frustration and anger, Satan takes advantage of it. Here's another area that will, uh, I guarantee you, grab a few people. But you know what? We just feel kind of like politicians are fair game, that you are free to say anything you want to say about a politician. Now, I do believe that we have a system that encourages, you know, dissent and that you can voice your dissent, but there's a right and wrong way to do it. I mean, there are times that I've heard Christians rail on a presidential candidate or something like that in ways that I guarantee you are not healthy. You can disagree without being demon-possessed and without giving yourself over to just, you know, I mean, putting a person to shame with the words that you say. You know, it doesn't matter whether that politician hears you or not, but you could be opening up a door to the devil through the things that you're saying. Satan is going to take advantage of our words. Romans 6, 16 again says, Don't you realize that to whom you yield yourself, servant to obey his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You need to set a watch before your mouth. You need to control your thoughts. You need to control your actions. You need to recognize that somebody, the demonic realm, is trying to take a shot at you every day of your life. If you will allow them, they come in for no other purpose except to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10 says that. God is trying to have dominance and control in your life so that he can release his blessing in his life into your life. Satan, on the other hand, is trying to snare you into bitterness, unforgiveness, ungodliness of all kind. And every time you do that, there is a spiritual dynamic that happens. And some people just don't recognize that every time you act, you are either obeying God and thereby releasing the power of God in your life or you are obeying the devil and releasing the power of the devil in your life. But most people don't really think about that. They allow all kinds of things in their life that if they recognized they were going to be reaping a result from this, they would never do it. You know, I have a number of things come to mind. There was uh, one Bible college student whose wife was suffering severe depression, so he brought her in. I sat down and began to talk to her and tell her about how she could get delivered from this depression. And anyway, she says that she's battled depression since she was a little tiny girl, that uh, she would go through a period where for a month or two months, a year, she would just be severely depressed. She would treat it with medication. And I was saying, well, you don't want to live that way. You need to get over it. And she had totally embraced this and accepted it and thought this was just the way that she was going to be. And she started saying terrible things and saying, this is just the way I am, and it's not hurting anything. I get over it, and everything will be okay in a month or so or something like that. And I began to start showing her from Scripture. Out of James chapter 1, it says that sin is conceived in your emotions. Every time you have negative emotions, and I'm not only talking here about sadness or depression, but it could be anger, it could be fear. There's a lot of different emotions. Every time you have one of these negative emotions, you are conceiving something. And there's a lot of people, see, that don't want the birth. You don't want suicide. You don't want a, a marriage to fall apart. You don't want strife. You don't want all of these things, but you allow these negative emotions to flow through you, not realizing that we're in a spiritual war. And when you give in and you allow your flesh just to flash up and you start saying and doing these things, Many times people see, just think, well, they didn't hear it. Nobody knows. It's okay. But no, it's not okay. You are releasing spiritual forces. 
There are, is a battle going on, and they are just looking for an opportunity. I use this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Satan is going about seeking whom he may devour, and he can't devour just everybody. If he could, if Satan was the one that was in control, if he just could do whatever he wanted, I can guarantee you every single person watching or listening to this broadcast would be totally devastated because that is his will. It says in uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief, talking of Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That is what he wants to do. And if he had his freedom, every person would be totally devastated. There would be no good anywhere. But see, God has a will. And the other part of that verse, John 10, 10, Jesus went on to say, but I am come that you might have life and to have it more abundantly. Jesus is trying to release life into you. Satan is trying to steal, kill, and destroy anything that good that you've got. And they are both willing and able to move and to manifest those things in your life, but the determining factor is you. And see, if you would recognize that this battle is going on, and that today, the things that you say, the decisions that you make, everything that you do is either going to empower God to release His life into you, or it's going to empower Satan to just suck from you the life that God has already given you and and still kill and destroy. If you were to look at things that way, it would make a difference. And yet most people disconnect what is happening in their life from their own choices and from their own actions and try and blame it on fate or whatever. You know, I remember an instance where I went to a church. I won't mention where this was, but it was a church that believed God could heal but didn't believe it was God's will to heal every time. And they had just recently, within the last six months, started saying, no, it's God's will for every person to be well. So this was a brand new step of faith for them. The people in the congregation were beginning to hear the word, and they were beginning to start believing God for things. And two days before I arrived in that church, they had a funeral for a 17-year-old boy. He had been in a coma for, I think, six weeks, and the entire church had fasted and prayed, trying to implement the things that they were being taught that it was God's will for this boy to be healed, and he went ahead and died anyway. They had the funeral just two days before I got there. And so there was a tremendous amount of conflict, turmoil, questions in that church. And when I came there, I went out with the parents of that child that died for the first three days that I was there. I went out and ate with them every day after the morning meetings, trying to figure out exactly what had gone on. And these people, because... Everybody had given their best. They had prayed, they had fasted, they had done everything that they knew to do, and yet this boy had died. Many of them were beginning to back off what the Word said and just say, well, maybe it's not God's will to heal every time. And I told them, I said, nope, that's not true. And they said, well, then what's the problem? I said, I don't know what the problem is, but I can guarantee you God's Word says that it is His will for you to be healed. He's already done it. And as I talked to these parents, here's what I discovered over a three-day period of time. The parents of this boy who died, had been in so much strife in their life that they were planning on getting a divorce. They had already made plans. They had talked about it with the children. And because of that, there was a lot of strife, a lot of hurt, a lot of emotion in that home. And the morning that this tragedy happened with this boy, the mother had had an argument with the boy and said she hated him. And she says, get out of my house and never come back again. And she probably didn't mean what she said. She was saying it out of the heat of an emotion. I guarantee you, kids can get on your nerve. Amen. I've raised some kids, and I tell you, raising kids is harder than raising the dead. Amen. It's true. So I'm not sitting here trying to condemn her, but I'm saying that she said, get out of my life, never come back again. Well, that day, because the boy had been hurt, he went and violated school property. policy, left the school grounds, went over to a kid's house. They were eating lunch at this kid's house and they got out a gun and were playing with it. And he accidentally shot himself in the head. And that's the reason he had been in a coma for six months or six weeks. And they just couldn't understand how could this have happened? If it was really God's will, then certainly he would have been raised up and he would have lived. And they didn't understand. 
But see, the Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 16, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. See, there's a lot of people that they just say, well, you know what? I agree that strife isn't the best thing. Nobody likes it, but after all, it's just normal and that this is the way it is and families just fight and then they get over it. And there's people that tolerate levels of strife in their life that they don't realize that they're in a war. And Satan, the Bible says, again, James 3, 16, where envy and strife is, there is confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So if God isn't the author of confusion, guess who is? Satan. Satan is the one who brings confusion. And where envy and strife is, there is confusion. There's Satan in every evil work. You just fling a door open to the devil. And then don't be surprised if you see somebody die, if you see sickness, if you see poverty, if you see tragedy come, because Satan jumps on things like that. He uses it in your life. What I'm trying to say is that, you know what, we are in a spiritual battle and you cannot afford the luxury of strife. You can't indulge it. See, people who think that way and think, well, you know, a certain amount of strife, it's just normal. It's the way you're supposed to live. No, that's not the way that God created us to be. And you know what, you need to fight it. I'm not saying that we'll ever live totally free from all strife from every source, but I'm saying you ought to never just accept it, indulge it, promote it and think that this is the way it has to be. You need to recognize that every time you get into strife, it opens a door to every evil work. Anything that Satan wants to do in your life, he has access to it when you're in strife. You know, I remember when I got drafted and I was I went through basic training and, uh, you know, during basic training, uh, we were in situations where there were just explosions all of the time. We we would go out on these maneuvers and stuff and they would have these low crawl pits and they were always teaching us how to throw hand grenades, how to shoot weapons, etc. And so there was always these explosions and over a period of six months time in training, I got kind of used to that to where it just, you know, was kind of normal. It didn't bother you because I knew we were in the States. I knew it was training. I knew nobody was trying to kill me. And so I just kind of hardened myself to it and it got to where it didn't mean anything. And then they flew us to Vietnam. And I arrived in Vietnam, in Long Bend, Vietnam, at 2 o'clock in the morning. Never will forget that. And it was, we got out of the plane, and uh, they were under a mortar attack, and we literally had to low crawl from the plane to a bunker and hide in this bunker until the attack was over, and then we came out. But you know what? All of a sudden, as we were in that situation, we were low crawling. Then a little bit later, about an hour or two later, after we'd been processed, they put us in this temporary barracks. And I remember laying on a cot and the cot was actually bouncing from explosions. Now, I'd heard explosions before in basic, but you know, as I was laying there and thinking about what was going on, all of a sudden it dawned on me that this isn't uh, the friendly fire anymore. This isn't training somebody is shooting rockets at us. And it was close enough that I could hear the explosion and my bunk was bouncing. And you know what? All of a sudden I realized I'm in, I'm at war. I've got people trying to kill me. And you know what? It sobered me up. Before, I remember going uh, under the concertina wire and they had these, uh, you know, uh, machine guns shooting overhead and we had to stay low underneath it. And even though I knew that there was some danger there, I thought, you know what, the the army isn't going to kill me. They aren't shooting those. They would tell you that the bullets were six inches above you, and so you had to stay low. And I figured they're probably three feet, four feet above you because they don't want to kill anybody. That's not going to look good. And so I took everything with a grain of salt. They always tried to make everything you know, one way, but it just didn't have that effect on me. I didn't take it to heart. But when I was in Vietnam that very first night, all of a sudden everything sunk in and I realized I was in a place where there were people trying to kill me. And you know what? My attitude changed. Everything changed. I got to where, man, instead of just half-heartedly listening to instructions, I got they didn't have to do anything to get our attention. When they started training us, and we went through a week of training once we got into Vietnam about how to adjust to the country and things that would be happening, I guarantee you I was all ears. 
And everybody was. And you know what made the difference? Because we realized we were in a war zone. We realized that, man, this was life and death. And because of it, we had a seriousness about us that we didn't have when we were in the States. And yet all of us knew that eventually we were headed to Vietnam. And yet it made a difference once you realized that you were in a battle. And this is the point that I'm trying to get across is that whether you realize it or not, hopefully you're going to realize it through this series, that you are in a battle. Satan is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is trying to destroy your life today. Now, you could become overwhelmed with that and fearful, but on the other hand, God is also going about seeking who will respond to him, trying to get the blessing and the power and the anointing of God. And, of course, God is infinitely greater than the devil. There's no reason for you to panic. There's no reason for you to come into such fear that you get to where you can't function. But you do need to sober up. You do need to recognize that we're in a battle and that you don't have the luxury of just indulging your emotions and getting into the flesh and doing things. You know, there's people that I minister to all of the time that they want the results that they see in my life, but they don't want to do what I do. Man, they want to sit down and watch as the stomach turns on the television and indulge themselves. They watch X-rated, R-rated things and they uh, indulge emotions and feelings that I would never indulge because I recognize there is a spiritual battle going on. And if I ever open up my heart and begin to start allowing those kind of things to come into my mind and into my heart, Satan is going to take an advantage of that. So I live a very restricted life. I reject a lot of things that other people do. And yet people, they would love to see their son raised from the dead the way that I did by the grace of God. They would love to get those results, but they don't want to spend the time in the Word. They don't want to seek God. They don't want to yield to God. They want to be out here in the world and they think, well, it's not hurting me to do all of this stuff. Well, it may not hurt you at that exact moment, but I guarantee you seeds are being planted. There is a warfare going on. You can't be tempted with something that you don't think. If you would quit opening yourself up to the strife and division and the things that we use for entertainment, I guarantee you Satan wouldn't have those inroads into your life to do those things. I remember this guy that I led to the Lord. He was the first person ever indicted by the jury of California three times before he was a teenager. He lived in reformatory since he was five years old. And because of all of this, he had been around so much strife and so much... I mean, there was just anger and resentment in him that when he got born again and came into our church, he just began to criticize everything. I mean, he criticized people for using soap because it wasn't natural. And I tell you what, he could have used a lot of soap. He, he needed it. He criticized people because they peeled their potatoes and that was the most nutritious part of it is the peel. And I mean, he just had an opinion about everything. And anyway, after a month or two of this, he came to me one day and he says, you know what? I'm leaving this church. I'm going to go back out into the desert because there's so much strife in this church. And I just got bold and told this guy, I said, you know what? There is strife in this church. But I said, it's all coming from you. There wasn't any strife among the members until you came in here and started criticizing anybody and everybody I said, you're the source of this strife. And I wasn't sure what his reaction was going to be, but praise God, he had a good reaction. And he responded by saying, I didn't realize it. And I said, you didn't realize it when you're over here and you go in and you rag on people and you criticize them over everything that they do, that people aren't going to like that. And this guy just sat down and he told me that he was the first person indicted by the California grand jury three times before he was a teenager, etc. He told me his background. And he says, I guess I didn't realize that was strife. I just thought it was normal. He says, if you were to tell me to act healed when I feel sick, I could do that because I felt healed before. But he says, when you're telling me to walk in love, he says, I don't guess I know how to do it. I have never felt love. And I just had to take this guy and start teaching him through the life of Jesus what it's like to love people. But, you know, I'm using that to illustrate a point. Some people have come from a background where screaming, yelling, and doing things may just be natural to you. And you may think, well, this is the way families are. Well, there's plenty of families like that, but that's not the way that God made us to be. 
And again, James 3.16, where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. There's some people that have just accepted that you treat your own family one way, but you treat strangers better than that. There are many of you that wouldn't dare treat me the way you treat your kids, and yet you wonder why you're having problems with your kids. Well, scream and yell at me and tell me to go make my bed, and you lousy thing, how come you haven't done this? And see how our relationship gets along. See, you have a double standard. You wouldn't treat a stranger that way, but you'd treat your own family, the people you're supposed to love more than anybody else that way, and just blast them over things. And then you wonder why that there's rebellion and why there's these kind of things. See, that's not the way that it works. If you want to have a godly relationship, you're going to have to start guarding your tongue and realize that you can't tolerate levels of strife like that. Satan comes in through envy and strife, and he de destroys. He puts every evil work into your life, and you cannot afford those type of luxuries. You need to look at strife just like you would a, a cobra in your house, a snake. I can guarantee you there's many of you that would not allow a snake just to live in your home. Maybe it'd go hide somewhere in a heating vent or some place, and you may not see it for a week or a month. But if you knew that it was in that home and it was lurking there, I guarantee you there are some of you ladies that you would just say, that's it, I don't care if it takes a year, five years, or whatever, but you're getting that snake out of here. I will not live in the same house with a cobra that's on the loose. It may not be an immediate threat at that exact moment, but you'd never know where it was. You just wouldn't live that way. And yet I can guarantee you strife is more deadly than a snake ever thought about being. You need to get out of this complacency and recognize we're in a war and we cannot tolerate strife, unforgiveness, sexual immorality. There are some of you who look at pornographic things and you think, well, I'm never going to act it out, but you just are into pornography. Every time you do that, you are releasing spiritual powers into your life. You are giving place to the devil that I can guarantee you is going to cost you something. It'll take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer than you want to stay. You need to resist this stuff and recognize we are in a spiritual war. You aren't on R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. You aren't back in a secured area where your actions don't count. Every one of us are exposed to the forces of the devil every single day. And you know what? He will take advantage of the things that you do. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, Neither give place to the devil. What that's saying is that you are the one that gives Satan the inroads into your life. And how do those kind of things happen? Well, they happen through our actions, through our thoughts, through the things that we say and do. Your emotions can give Satan place. And there's a lot of people that just every once in a while, they just feel like you ought to just give in. It would feel good to just have a pity party, to get in and, and uh, just let your guard down. I, I've felt like that before. You know, I remember when my um, youngest son... Uh, had died, my oldest son called me and told me that he was dead, and immediately my wife and I agreed, and we spoke our faith and commanded him to come back to life, and as we got dressed and headed into Colorado Springs, during that period of time, you know what, I had negative emotions. I felt like just, man, how long can you stand? How long can you be strong? Every once in a while, you just got to run up a white flag and let it out and gripe and complain. I felt all those kind of things. But you know what? I'm aware that we're in a battle. And I'm aware that if I would have started speaking forth my fears and my unbelief, that it would have negated my faith. And so instead, even though I felt like just, you know, saying, well, we, we lost this one. We're beaten. Let's give it up. Let's quit. You know what? I started building myself up and speaking positive words. I started speaking that he will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord and praise God to the glory of God. When we got into Colorado Springs, after five hours of my son being dead, he rose from the dead. God resurrected him. And I can guarantee you, I firmly believe that if I would have let my feelings uh, if I'd have vented them, if I would have started speaking my frustration, if I would have started complaining about it's not fair, and if I would have said the things that I felt like, I believe that Satan takes advantage 
of things like that. That's how He gains inroad into our life. Let me show you some scriptures out of uh, Proverbs chapter 18. There's a lot of ways that Satan gains access to us, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of them, but I just want to hit on a couple of things, major things here. Proverbs chapter 18, in verse 20, it says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Verse 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You know, just as in this example that I was giving about my son, that I can guarantee you there's times you feel like just speaking out your frustration, your feelings, and things like this. You know, uh, there's another scripture over in Matthew chapter 6. Let me see if I can find this one. This is where Jesus is talking about the lilies of the field, how He provides for them, and if He takes care for all of these things, how much more will He take care of? of us in all of these physical things. And over here in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? And talks about the fowls of the air, and all of these things. Um... In verse 30, he says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, this is taking a little bit of liberty with Scripture, but I believe it's a scriptural principle. It goes along perfectly with what I just said in Proverbs 18, 20, and 21. But in this verse 31, it says, Take no thought, saying, you know, I, when I believe that a thought begins to start being yours is when you start speaking it out your mouth. You can't keep all kinds of thoughts from coming. For instance, when I was told that my son was dead, you know what, there was a thought of grief. There was a thought of fear. There was a thought of panic. I can't keep those thoughts from coming. I'm human. I, I heard Kenneth Hagin one time say that it's like you can't keep a bird from flying over your head. You know what? You don't have that kind of control, but you can keep it from, uh, you know, uh, lighting there and then building a nest and living on top of your head. You can do that. Well, you can't necessarily keep a thought from coming. Thoughts will come. You are going to experience negative thoughts, but you don't have to receive them. They don't have to be a part of you. How is it that you keep this thought from becoming your thought? Satan will put thoughts feelings, attitudes in your heart. How is it that you keep those things from taking root and beginning to grow and producing the negative crop that he's trying to produce? Well, the way you do it is by take no thought saying. If you don't say it, then it's not yours. But the moment you start verbalizing and speaking forth these negative things, then those things become yours and they start releasing this negative power in your life. And see, this is the attitude that you've got to adopt. You need to recognize that you can't afford the luxury of speaking things contrary to what you're believing for. There are some of you that are believing for healing. And you're asking God to heal you, and you may stand and say, well, I believe I'm healed. But then if you don't see the physical manifestation and somebody calls you up on the phone, how are you doing? And you just start telling them how bad you feel and you start going into all of this stuff. You don't realize it, but you are releasing a spiritual force by doing that. Again, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can't only just speak life with your tongue, but you can speak death. And the truth is most of us speak much more death than what we speak life. We, ca we counter ourselves with our own tongue. We're hung by the tongue. We are destroying our own self. We're criticizing and tearing down our own family. You know, I really feel in my heart like I'm speaking directly to some people right now that you're praying for one thing. You're praying for restoration of your marriage, and yet you're just constantly criticizing and beating it down and speaking negatively about it on the other hand. You are releasing a negative spiritual force, death, that is going to counter what you're praying for. And even though God wants to move in behalf and see this restoration, you are releasing a spiritual force with these negative words. Same thing about your children. You've got to be careful how you talk about them. 
Again, I don't believe that it's wrong for you to state a fact. If somebody asks, don't sit there and say everything is perfect when it isn't perfect. You can say, well, you know, there, there's some problems, but, and then you counter it with what you're believing for. Really, it just all depends where you put your butt. If you put the first, if you say, well, here's a problem, but, everything's going to work, well, then that's okay. But if you state and say, well, I'm believing God for a miracle, but, and then you start examining and explaining all of the bad things, you have just destroyed what you're trying to accomplish. So it really does matter where you put your butt. Amen. That may sound uh, kind of strange, but I bet you'll remember that. Amen. And you know what? Sometimes you just have to acknowledge that, hey, I've got a problem. I'm fighting sickness, but, and then you counter it with the Word of God. You need to be careful about your words. Your words are releasing life or they are releasing death. And many people just are oblivious of this and they allow all kinds of things to come out of their mouth that they don't want. Look back at these verses here in Proverbs chapter 18. It says in verse 20, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Notice the terminology. He's drawing a word picture here. In other words, it's like every word you say out your mouth is a seed that's going to produce after its kind. And if you are speaking griping, complaining, and just negativism, did you know that that's going to produce fruit, that you are going to wind up eating those words? If you are bitter in your heart, I can guarantee you it started with you speaking forth things that you shouldn't have said. Now, I know some people think, oh, no, it's somebody else. But you know what? You can't keep uh, a bird from flying over, but you can keep it from taking, uh, making a nest there and living there. You can't keep a problem from coming, but you can keep those problems from dominating and controlling you if you were to speak the right positive things. Your words are important. And this is one of the ways, see, that because we don't realize that we're in a war, that Satan takes advantage of the words that we say. By your words, you shall be justified. By your words, you shall be condemned. Matthew chapter 12, I believe verse 35 says that. You don't realize how important the words are, and so we speak forth just foolishness, silly things, unbelief things, things that allow Satan as a roaring lion to just devour us because we let down our guard. Here's some scriptures. I haven't gotten to all of these. Let me just go through and read some of these. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Uh, this is uh, the apostle, or excuse me, this is when Jesus was speaking to the apostle Paul. Actually, he had given these words to Ananias, and these are the words of God through Ananias to the apostle Paul. And here's his instructions about what he's supposed to do. It says, you are to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now notice here the Lord was saying through Ananias that you were supposed to go preach the gospel and as you do turn these people from the power of Satan unto God. Now see there's a lot of people that don't really recognize Satan is controlling and operating in their life. They just think that it's circumstances, fate, luck, the way that things have happened. This is making it very clear that they have been under the influence of Satan. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, there it talks about that we were by nature a child of Satan before our conversion and that we were under his control and under his dominance. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, "...in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them." This is saying that before a person is born again, Satan blinds them to the truth, to the truths of the gospel. Did you know that Satan is actively at work in this world today to harden people and to blind them towards the things that would open them up to the truths of God? I guarantee you it is not a passive battle. Satan is actively pursuing and trying to destroy people. And, it, and one of the reasons that he's made the inroads and that he's got the control that he's got is because as a whole, even the church doesn't really recognize this warfare that we're in. They really don't. You know, I'm on television, so therefore I'm not against television. 
But I'm telling you that television as a whole is one of Satan's greatest tools because Christians are plugged into it. And of course, non-Christians listen to it probably even more so than Christians do. But we are just being fed a steady diet of homosexuality, sexual immorality, uh, violence, uh, all kinds of things, strife, hatred, sarcasm, things that are just being, I mean, it's like sewage and it's being poured right into our home. Satan is using it. God can use television. I don't believe that television in itself is immoral, but a lot of the stuff on it is. And I'm telling you, Satan is using these kind of things to destroy people. There's some of you that may go watch X-rated, R-rated movies and just allow yourself to open, open yourself up to lust, which I guarantee you is Satan's tool, not God's tool. And it's amazing how people just think, oh, I can watch this stuff and it doesn't affect me. I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 that says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you say, well, oh, I can watch this stuff and it doesn't bother me, then according to that scripture, you're deceived. You may convince yourself that you're not being influenced and polluted by it, but I guarantee you the Bible says don't be deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. You cannot maintain your equilibrium and just indulge yourself and allow yourself to do all of this. You know, David made this statement. I believe it's Psalms chapter, I'm not sure the exact chapter, Psalms 140 or 141, somewhere around there. He says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. You know, if Christians were to make that decision and just say, you know what, I'm not going to watch anything that's wicked. I am not going to paint a picture on the inside of me of lust, anger, immorality, hatred, strife, killing, murder, etc., etc., etc. If you were to make that kind of a commitment and recognize that every time you open yourself up to this, there is a spiritual power there waiting to gain an inroad into your life, to put fear into you, to cause hatred and violence and all of these kind of things. You know, you can't act out what you've never seen. One of the reasons we have so much violence in our society is because we have so much violence on television and in movies and things like that. One of the reasons we have so much immorality today is because we have so much immorality on the television. I tell you, there's a relationship, and you have to have your head in the sand not to be able to see it. There is a battle raging, and everything that goes on is either going to release God's power into your life or it's going to release Satan's power into your life. This is saying that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Satan is an active force. He is at work. He is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. He's going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And you just putting your head in the sand and saying, nope, I don't believe that we're in a war, and I'm just going to continue on. It's not going to change the situation. It just means you're going to be destroyed. It means you're going to be one of the casualties of war. I tell you, the truth is we are in a spiritual war. And it's to your advantage to wise up, to realize it, and begin to start training yourself and get in and fight this battle. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you aren't born again, you definitely are one of these children of disobedience. And there is a spirit at work on the inside of you is what this verse is saying. Even if you are born again and if you aren't obeying and following the leadership of God, there is a spirit at work on the inside of you. And that's just what the scripture says. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Some people don't believe that there is a kingdom of darkness, a power of darkness. And so therefore they don't appreciate totally what Jesus delivered us from. But this says that we were under the power of darkness and we've been delivered from it. I tell you, Satan is an active force that is at work in the world. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. By saying this, it establishes that there are principalities and powers and that they are at work and that you do have to deal with them. I've already used Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. That puts responsibility on us. You, by your actions, by your thoughts, by your words, are either giving place to the devil or giving place to God. 
Man, that is just such a profound truth. And it's amazing to me how people disassociate their actions with the results and just think that there's no correlation. They don't have a clue why it is that Satan is destroying them. I hear people all of the time giving me this sad story about I just don't understand why the devil is after me. And they are just, I mean, living a life that is in opposition to God. I remember one time I had a horse that a guy came out to shoe, and this guy went to church with me is the reason I asked him to come shoe my horse. And as he was shoeing my horse, uh, we were just talking. And anyway, he got to talking about his girlfriend. I'd seen him with this woman at church, and I thought it was his wife. And he just kept talking about his girlfriend. And the way that he talked about her, it led me to believe that they weren't married. And so finally, I just asked him, I said, are y'all married? And he said, oh, no, we're just living together. He says, we think it's really wisdom. We've had so many friends that have gotten married and then they get divorced. And so we've been living together for six months to see whether, uh, you know, we should get married or not. And I said, I thought you said you were a Christian. And he says, well, I am. I got born again about four or five months ago. And I said, don't you realize that this is contrary to what God says? And I mean, this guy may have lied to me, but I don't think he did. He just, he was brand new Christian and he was just totally ignorant. He says, you mean God says something about just living with the person before you get married? And I began to start sharing the word with him. And he says, well, we we love each other and we're going to get married and so it'll be okay. And I began to explain to him, I said, you don't realize, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. I said, right now, you are living in a way that exempts you from God's power. You have yielded yourself to Satan. You are in violation of what the Word says, and by doing so, you have released demonic power in your life. I said, Satan is just having a heyday with you, and as we began to talk, he began to open up his heart. Usually it takes 30 minutes to shoe a horse. It took three hours to shoe this horse. This guy just was soaking it up changed his life. He, he moved out and they straightened their act up. See, some people think, well, it's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, there is something wrong with it. God told you not to do it. And for you to disobey God and to go out and do something else opens up a door to Satan. It does not mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God's mad at you. Sometimes, because it's been presented that way, people have, uh, you know, come against these standards and says, man, the church is wrong to tell you that you're terrible and God doesn't love you because you've shacked up with somebody. That's not what I'm saying. God does love you and he wants better for you. But by you violating God's instructions, that means that you're automatically obeying the lust of your own flesh. You have thrown open a door to the devil and Satan is going to come in and eat your lunch and pop the bag. You don't want that. You need to get out of that. You are in a spiritual battle and you cannot afford the luxury of just ignoring the instructions that God has given you. I tell you, I'm saying some things that aren't real popular, but I tell you they're true and they could really help you.